My name is Thomas Jefferson. On April 13, 1743, I was born in the colony of Virginia, in my house in my hometown Shadwell. I was the third of ten children in a very privileged family. I was a planter, lawyer, violinist, inventor, botanist, and architect. I was blessed to have had a great private education where I learned English, of course, alongside with Latin, Greek, and French. I then attended the College of William and Mary to further my education and study law. While studying law, I had the honor to be taught by the great George Wythe, a major influencer in my life, father figure, and fellow singer, too. No man ever left behind him a character more venerated than George Wythe. He had a lasting impression on me. I began writing a bibliography on my great teacher, which I still, to this day, have not finished. I began building my future home in Monticello in 1768. I designed it myself, and the work began on the 5,000 acres of land. I met a beautiful woman by the name of Martha Wales Skelton, who moved in with me in December of 1770. We shared an interest in horseback riding, literature, and music. She was my third cousin, so we immediately had a very close connection. She was tall, thin, athletic, redheaded, and shy as can be. I loved her with all my heart, and we got married on January 1st, 1772. We had a beautiful wedding. Two families became one family in the same family. We were happily married and had six children together. I was elected to the Congressional Congress in 1775. Travel back in my day was not as convenient as it would be in the future, so I arrived in the year 1776. Congress chose a committee of five, myself alongside Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Robert R. Livingston, and Roger Sherman had the responsibility of drafting the most important document in our nation's history. Although Richard Henry Lee was in fact responsible for the resolution calling for independence to Congress, I was selected to draft it because I am better than him. Well, somewhat. I was a known, brilliant writer who was more likable and had fewer enemies than my fellow father Richard Henry Lee. I knew that this document would be read aloud to countless of Americans. The Declaration is an expression of the American mind, not just my mind. I began the Declaration of Independence with this phrase. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. I loved it. However, Benjamin Franklin did not. He changed it to, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I have to admit, it does sound better that way. It takes a true man to admit when he is defeated. The committee submitted the Declaration of Independence to Congress on June 28, 1776, just two days before it was scheduled to be voted upon. The declaration that I wrote passed and was now to be edited. I watched congressmen slowly destroy my baby that I had worked so hard on day in and day out. As much as I disliked it, I was not a great speaker, so I kept my mouth shut. 86 devastating changes later, the declaration was signed and sent to the printer. I returned to Virginia to be a legislator, where I drafted the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom advocating for the separation of church and state. It took seven years, but finally it passed. I then served as governor of the state of Virginia for two years during the war. In 1781, the British invaded my beloved state of Virginia, and we had to withdraw from Richmond. I personally did not have any military experience, and Virginia needed a governor who could adequately serve them in war. So I resigned. After 10 years of marriage, just a few months after the birth of our final child, Martha died at the age of 33. I was with her for her final breaths, in which I promised her I will never marry again. 
In 1790, President Washington was searching for someone brilliant such as myself to be the first Secretary of State. I humbly accepted his offer. Being Secretary of State was nice, but it meant I had to work with the Federalist Alexander Hamilton. His centralized government stance was simply a European-style tyranny waiting to happen. Our relationship now pleases me looking back, knowing that he would eventually be shot and killed by my future Vice President Aaron Burr in a duel. I resigned from Secretary of State and ran for President in 1776. I lost by a mere three electoral college votes to John Adams. At the time, the runner-up to president became the vice president. I served four years as vice president before running again for president in the year 1800. I won that election in a tie with Aaron Burr, and the House of Representatives voted me as the third president of the United States of America. I served two terms from 1800 to 1809 and doubled the United States during that time. Ha! Not many people can say that now, are there? After my presidency, I went home to Monticello. I envisioned a university free of church influences, where students could specialize in what they wanted to study. I believed that well-educated people produce a stable society, and in 1819, I founded the University of Virginia. My health had been declining, and on July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, I died peacefully in my room in Monticello. I wish to have had only three things on my tombstone. Author of the Declaration of Independence, author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. Being president was overrated anyways.